Hello and welcome to the third part of this series on demystifying automated reasoning. I'm Adam Pease and today we're going to get down to the, really the heart of the matter which is the actual theorem proving algorithm. So what is automated reasoning? Um, there are, uh, you know, this is one of these terms that uh, people can use in different ways, but I'm gonna use it in the way that the uh, logical automated theorem proving community uh, uses it as sort of uh, representative of the Conference on Automated Deduction uh, and the International Joint Conference on Automated Reasoning. Uh, I'm concerned about how they use the term and there may be other uses of the term, but we'll stick with this one. So it's you know, a process of using computer software to approximate a certain kind of human reasoning, but using mathematical logic, occasionally some other formalism, but basically a certain kind of mathematical logic. Uh, and I'm going to further narrow this by, in this uh, series, I'm just talking about refutation theorem proving or proof by contradiction. I'll tell you a bit about what that means in more detail in a moment. And this is in first order logic. There are many different uh, formal logics that have a well, uh, well specified mathematics. First order logic or FOL or predicate calculus uh, is what you probably had some introduction to in your schooling if you had a scientific and technical education, especially one in computer science. Um, and I'm going to talk about really just the two steps that are involved. First is kind of preliminary called canonicalization, uh, which is getting uh, the, the formulas into an easy to process form. We've actually talked about that already uh, and created an algorithm for it in the second video of this series. And uh, the, step, the second step is the actual theorem proving that I'm going to concentrate on here. And a bit of a disclaimer, you know, this is a highly mathematical area. It's an area that took me a while to get into because I'm not uh, by training a mathematician. I, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable when I see lots of mathematical symbols. It takes me a while to get into it. Uh, so I wanted to create an introduction that's really suitable for programmers. Uh, mathematicians and logicians may find this too casual, but if, if you do, then pick another source because there's lots of sources for you that uh, dis uh, describe this area in a highly rigorous mathematical way, but there's really very little for programmers. So that's my target audience here. So let's start uh, with an inference example. Um, and so here uh, I'm going to ha show uh, just a very simple bit of reasoning uh, with uh, some spatial relationships. So we've got uh, these three uh, cartoons here. We've got uh, an ostrich one on the left, an elephant one in the middle, and an ostrich two on the right. And we're just going to reason about their relative positions. So it's really, uh, like most uh, tutorials, uh, I've picked an example that's almost trivial so that the example itself doesn't become overwhelming. Um, and hopefully you can extrapolate to more complicated problems from here. So we've got uh, elephant one is to the left of ostrich two. So uh, forgive the, the video uh, hiding the ostrich two on the right. Maybe I'll scroll this down a little bit for now so you can get used to the example and we'll hide it later. Um, and then we have uh, ostrich one is left of elephant one. So very simple. And what we want to determine automatically is, uh, is ostrich one to the left of ostrich two? So really simple stuff, um, but useful if, if this were a more complicated problem. And in order to accomplish this, we need not only these three, these two facts and the query, the thing we're going to ask, uh, but we also need one rule. And this rule says that if we have a, an orientation relationship between two things and the stated relationship, which we'll denote by this variable r, um, then this is a transitive relationship. If this relation holds between x and y and y and z, then it therefore holds between x and z. So simple axiom of transitivity, but for a non-binary relation. Uh, so a little more complicated maybe than, than some folks have been used to. So the first thing we do is this uh, canonicalization into conjunctive normal form. I'm going to speed through this because we covered that in the second talk, but just to show it on a different problem. So first thing we do is remove our equivalences. So you can see we've got this arrow, uh, 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 the implication uh, operator here in our first axiom, and uh, A implies B equals not A or B. So here we do this simple transformation uh, to get rid of that, that symbol. Next thing we do are, is to move the negations inwards. So we've got or, a wrapping around a not, wrapping around an and, 
And so if we want to push that knot in, then we flip the and to an or, as you can see. So now we have a nested pair of ors, and we've negated both of these first two literals, uh, these, these individual uh, clauses or tuples that you see, the orientation statements. So instead of uh, not and orientation, orientation, we have or not orientation, not orientation as a pattern. So simple transformation. Um, and then uh, with regard to the algorithm we introduced in the last video, uh, we actually don't need uh, the middle four steps because all the variables already are standardized. We don't have any explicit nested quantification that uh, could result in some uh, renaming. Uh, we don't have any quantifiers to move left. Uh, everything's already universally quantified in the outermost scope. Uh, we don't have any existentials, so we don't have any skullamization. We don't have any AND uh, operators to distribute over OR. So the last thing we're left with is we just need to flatten our ORs. We've got a nested OR, uh, and so we can just have a single OR amongst three clauses rather than a nested OR amongst uh, two uh, binary, uh, uh, binary relationships. So we wind up with not orientation, OR not orientation, OR orientation, etc. with the variables. Right. Um, and just some terminology uh, that I mentioned in passing. So each of these tuples is called a literal, and if it's negated, we call it a negated literal. And this is going to be key for our uh, theorem proving algorithm in a moment. All right. So here's what we wind up with. We wind up two with two facts, a normalized rule uh, that's just a in conjunctive normal form, um, and a query. So now we can get started. So we're going to do, as I mentioned, refutation theorem proving or proof by contradiction. And the way in which we do that is we negate the query and then try to find a contradiction. Uh, and it's a little counterintuitive. It's like, if I assume that this isn't true, what can I conclude? And if in the end you come down to a contradiction, um, you know that assuming the opposite of your query has resulted in a contradiction, therefore, the positive version of your query must be true. That's the, the informal sketch of how this works. And it really is the standard in the community. Unfortunately, it is a little counterintuitive to, to read such proofs, uh, but it results in a nice, simple algorithm. And that's what we want as computer scientists. So here we go. We've negated the query. Just put a knot around uh, is ostrich1 to the left of ostrich2. And now we get started. Um, but a, a, another operation that I uh, need to detail here is known as unification. If you've ever done any prologue programming, uh, this will hopefully be familiar to you, but not a lot of people have done prologue programming these days. So uh, unification, informally at least, is uh, do two of the two tuples, uh, two literals, have the same form but different values, or occasionally the same value, uh, that are compatible. So if we have, uh, we first we have to have uh, predicate symbols that are the same. Uh, so the orientation symbol is uh, the predicate here. It's the relationship, the name of the relationship. And then we have the arguments. And the arguments can't clash. We can't have uh, terms that are not equal in the same position in the two things we're trying to unify. Uh, but terms can unify with variables. And that's the case that fortunately we have here. So. You can see that uh, elephant1 corresponds to variable x, ostrich2 corresponds to ostrich y, and, uh, and the relationship of being, or the attribute of being to the left of something uh, is the variable r. And so the result of a unification is a list of bindings for variables. So on the left, we're showing the, the candidate unification between a rule and a fact. Over to the right, we've kind of simplified it a little bit. We've just taken out uh, this literal from the rule and looked at it in isolation so it, you can see it matching up very clearly with the fact. And you can also see that uh, the, the substitutions, you know, x becomes elephant one and so on. Uh, another key uh, that's mentioned, of course, in a lot of uh, unification algorithms is the fact that uh, you can't have shared variables. You can't get into a, a situation where you have uh, x is, uh, is substituted with y, and then y is substituted with x. Then you have a sort of circularity that destroys this whole thing. So 
uh, make sure that for each of the clauses or the literals being unified uh, that they have unique variable names, uh, no shared variable names. The end of the, the, or the result of a unification process is we come out with a list of substitutions, which is the list you see down below and to the right, uh, question mark x equals elephant one and so on. Uh, and I should note this is an example uh, taken from a prior publication. Uh, so I try, I've been trying to collect examples of spatial reasoning problems uh, for some future work. So okay, great. Now we've got we've done our canonicalization. We've uh, showed you how to do unification, and now we've got the actual process of doing the resolution theorem proving. And this starts with axiom selection. So here's another area where there's a tremendous amount of, of work and research in good approaches to axiom selection. There's sort of no one beautiful, perfect, uh, universal way to choose the best, best uh, statement to consider next. There are different ones under different circumstances. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're just going to pick the simplest one. So just pick the next one that's available and try it out and see what you get. So uh, we're just going to uh, have the, the query and then uh, go from there. So we start uh, with a list that we'll call to be used or TBU is how it often appears in the literature. And uh, we're going to start with our negated query. And then our knowledge base is all the things we know. These two facts about elephant one is left of ostrich two and this rule that expresses the transitivity of this relationship. So our goal is to match a negative literal with a positive literal. If we do that, they cancel out. If you're a science fiction fan, think of it like matter and antimatter canceling each other out. That's our goal here, because uh, that lets us simplify things. Uh, if you've got A and not A, you've got a contradiction. Um, and uh, for the purposes of this algorithm, we're, we're sort of trying to, to you know, explode those or pull them out or have them disappear or have them match. Um, so for a negative literal, we try to find a positive literal that unifies. Uh, and which one do we pick? Uh, so we're looking at our to be used. We're trying to find a match for the negated version, or really the positive version of that, because our, our uh, query is negated. And so on the right, we could uh, let's look at these two facts. Um, they're not negated. That's good. So they're the opposite of our query. Um, but the, they don't unify. Our terms don't match. So look at this uh, middle statement, orientation, elephant one, ostrich two. Well, right away, with respect to our to be used list, our query, the first argument, first argument is uh, ostrich one. And over on the right, this uh, middle statement it has a first uh, argument of elephant one. It doesn't match, doesn't unify, we can't use it. Uh, the third statement on the right has a similar problem. Okay, the first argument, ostrich one, matches, and we are matching a negative literal with a positive literal. That's good. But the second argument doesn't work because uh, for our query, we've got ostrich two, and for our fact on the right, we've got elephant one uh, for the second argument. They don't match. They don't unify. It doesn't work. So we have to pick uh, the uh, rule that is the, the first statement in our knowledge base. And we've got a choice of several of the literals there. Uh, the first two are negated. Well, that doesn't work because we're trying to match with a negated literal, so we want to find a positive literal. The third literal in this rule does match, uh, and in fact, it unifies uh, because it's all just filled with vari as just variables for its arguments. So good news, great, we found a match, um, and we can do some unification now. And we're just going to you know, we're going to ignore the negation. Uh, because those, that's going to cancel out a negated literal with the positive literal, and we're just going to focus on unifying uh, the, the unnegated literal uh, and, and see what happens. And we get this nice match, you know, x goes to ostrich 1, uh, z becomes ostrich 2, and r becomes left. And you can see the substitution list uh, on the left of your screen. So great, uh, so now we've got uh, the following because we have to do the substitution for the remainder of the rule. So if we go back, let's look at, uh, we've got substitutions for x, z, and r. So look at that first orientation statement. We've got an x, a y, and an r. So x is going to become equal to ostrich 1, and r is going to become equal to left. Okay, 
And similarly for the second statement, we've got y, z, and r. Well, we've got substitutions for z and r, ostrich 2 and left. And so you can see how uh, yeah, that turns into ostrich 2 and left. And of course, the final statement yeah, unifies com and substitutes completely, uh, becomes completely equal uh, to the thing we're trying to match in to be used. So fantastic. We've done the substitution. Now we can have matter and antimatter cancel each other out. That literal goes away. And we're left with just the following, a simplified uh, statement in our knowledge base. And that result actually becomes our new to be used item. That's one of the ways in which this method for axiom selection uh, works for us. Uh, anytime we have a result left over, we add it to to be used as something we're going to try to match again. And that works out really well in this case because now we've got the complicated thing that we're trying to find a match for, and we've got some really easy matches for it. Um, so in the first one, we, we really could match either. We have to pick one, so we're just going to go in order. And we're going to try to match this first literal, and we find that uh, it matches beautifully. So uh, orientation and orientation match. Ostrich 1 matches with ostrich 1 question mark y matches with elephant one and left matches with left. So we're left with a substitution that uh, y equals uh, uh, elephant one. So great, uh, we could have used the other, but we've done it in this order. Doesn't really matter in this case. Um, so we could have used the, the other uh, pair, but you know, we had to pick one, so that's what we did. All right, so we do the substitution. Uh, and now, surprisingly enough, because y was the one variable we didn't have a substitution for in our first resolution, uh, we do have it in the second one. Now we've got a fully instantiated or fully ground axiom in our to be used list. Um, so we've gone from the, see how we have a question mark y, we filled it in with elephant one, there it is. Uh, and so now both of these negated literals in a disjunction are fully ground. They, they have no variables in them. So matter and antimatter uh, annihilate, and uh, the, the negated literal and its positive version of the knowledge base go away. Uh, we set the result uh, over to the to be used list, and we're left with our last step. Very simple. And so we've got just a negated literal and a positive literal, and they're identical. So they match, they annihilate, and we're done. Um, that is the end. If we have nothing else uh, that can be matched, uh, then we know we have found ultimately a contradiction. This is the contradiction it works out to be, the, the kind of the end result. We've proved that uh, all of these steps hold. We've done a collection of very small operations which are truth-preserving and legitimate, and shown that if we make the opposite assumption in, in the start of this proof, if we negate our query, uh, then we wind up with, in the end, a simple contradiction. Right? So if we don't go into the many possible improvements, enhancements, heuristics, different strategies for allocating uh, memory or choosing how you sort things um, or doing th uh, things called subsumption, which maybe I'll get into in a, a future video. Uh, all of these simplifying uh, efficiency steps and approaches, this is ver a very simple mechanical algorithm. Um, stated like this, maybe if I can give you a little more detail and some, just some data structures, um, then pretty much any competent programmer could code this up. Uh, the problem is it's going to be very slow. Uh, and this is what people struggled with for a lot of years, is uh, the fact that uh, the base algorithm is quite slow. But there have been tremendous enhancements in, over the past few decades that mean actually the stuff's now really very, very fast, uh, even on very large knowledge bases. But fundamentally, it's a well-proven mathematics. It's not something just that a programmer dreamt up and did some testing on. Uh, there's mathematical proofs that show that this process doesn't reach wrong answers. As long as the premises are true, the algorithm itself is a truth-preserving algorithm. And each step is, is very simple. Uh, and uh, I wish somebody had had a, a simple presentation like this uh, to show me uh, a long time ago, uh, because it really isn't that hard uh, if you state it without some of the math, but just as a, a programming technique. Um, and the power of it, like in a lot of 
uh, scientific disciplines is the, and the beauty of it is you have a very simple thing that when you do it in the large or do it repeatedly uh, it can result in something very sophisticated and give you some really useful answers that would be otherwise very hard to calculate yourself people have been doing proofs ma mathematically for a very long time and having a machine that can do it that doesn't get tired and works much faster um, is a tremendous resource and so mathematicians are also making very good uses of uh, automated theorem proving these days as well. All right so that's it hopefully this uh, demystified a little bit of the process of a refutation theorem proving or first order proving proof by contradiction and if you like this let me know and subscribe and comment and uh, thanks for listening.